God is so good. What a good God. Now we stand. You got to listen to me because I'm going to cover some ground because I'm getting us where we need to be. We stand fully across the threshold into this new year now. We're no longer at the threshold. And Sunday a week ago, I preached about being in the place of in between. And in between is a bad place to be. You can be stuck, almost committed, almost in, almost made that, you know, pay grade raise, almost got that new house, almost got, you know, you can get in that land of almost. You can almost get up and pray. You can almost decide to really serve God. You get in that land of almost. And, and, and you know, we talked about it Sunday a week ago, how the circumstances of life brings us to those places. We saw some scripture. We talked about Moses. He come out of Egypt. He's got the people of Israel at his feet. They're about ready to cross over the Red Sea. And then behind them is the Egyptians, the Pharaoh coming. And God had him stuck right there in a middle place, a place of almost. But he had to strike the water with the uh, uh, staff that he had. And it opened up the Red Sea and he went across. And then the Lord blessed him. And that's so important to understand that we can use the provision of God, the Word of God, to get us across to the new place. And, and, and we talk about that out of the book of Joel. And Joel is one of those prophets in the Bible that we don't a lot of times pay attention to. But because this is the first of the year, I really, really started looking at this over a month ago and felt so strongly how important the book of Joel really is. It's a prophet. He's prophesying there, a young man. He's prophesying to Judah and Jerusalem. And this young man, this prophet, has got a word from God. And, and yet, listen to me, if we would look at Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17... This is the first verse of Scripture used in the first New Testament church. It's the first New Testament church. And here's Peter. And Peter is talking about what the prophet Joel had said back 2,600 years before that. And here he is. Peter is the, he's the announcer he is the uh, 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 bishop, if you were. He is the first apostle uh, preaching the first message of God uh, in the New Testament church. Amen. Think about that. If somebody was to say, I I've preached uh, thousands of messages. If somebody said, what's the first message you preached? I, I couldn't remember. But how many of you know that message set the pace, set the tone, set the whole definition of what God was going to do by his spirit. Amen. Now we had just had an upper room experience and the Holy Spirit came down in fire and launched this New Testament church into its existence. You and I today are a product of that moment that Peter is standing there in Jerusalem. Thousands of people came to the Lord. 3,000 were added to the Lord that day. And 120 people got filled with the Holy Ghost in the upper room. And Peter came out anointed of God. And the book that he chose to read and the scripture that he chose to use was right there. But instead, this is the beginning of what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Can you hear that? It shall come to pass in the last days. God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, telling forth the divine counsels uh, and your young uh, men shall see visions, divinely granted appearances and your old men, thank God for us, shall dream divinely suggested dreams. Wow, what a great way to start the church. And then uh, we got to read it. Go to jo Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. It's right here. And afterwards I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. So Peter stands up. You got to get this. 
It's the first. How many of you know when you start a new business, you a lot of times they'll save a dollar bill, the first 10, 20, $1, $5 that was spent, and they'll put it up on the board or up on the wall somewhere and say that was the first you know, money that came in. Now, how many of you know that we celebrate first? Do you know Baltimore is a city of first? And there's 190 to 200 first in Baltimore. Do you know the first artificial sugar sweetener was here in Baltimore? The first uh, uh, lamp post uh, gas lantern was here in Baltimore. The first lacrosse game was here in Baltimore. The first umbrella was here in Baltimore. The first uh, rubber gloves used in surgery was here in Baltimore. And on and on and on and on. The first archdiocese was here. And you could just keep reading that on. This is a city of first. That's why I have great hope for this city. I don't listen to the pundits. I listen to the Holy Ghost. A lot of people stood up doing the rites and they were nothing but echoes. They didn't have a voice. I'm not interested in an echo. I'm interested in a voice. Hallelujah. Sadly, the church has satisfied itself by hearing echoes. Instead of hearing a living voice, a prophetic word alive, we've become complacent and comfortable by hearing the same old, old hash, old leftovers repeated over and over. We need a fresh word from God. We need to know what is God saying about America. Amen. Now, the first section of Joel, uh, his prophecy to Judah and Jerusalem, I read it to you last week, Joel chapter 1 and verse 1 through 20. I am not going to read that. Uh, Joel chapter 1, verse 1 through 20, but I will read uh, verse 1 through 3. So if you want to put it on the screen. And it was all about the subject that he capsulized there was about desolation. And it was in three forms. It was a cry, its cause, and the calamity of it. There was a plague, a locust plague that had swept over the area, the region there and had devoured everything, every crop, every tree, everything that was alive and green, these locusts had swept down and had eaten everything. So it affected their economy, it affected their livelihoods, it, it affected their substance of eating. And this was a calamity of unparalleled uh, 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 example here. And this thing swept over, and Joel chapter 1, and the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethel, and uh, hear this, you aged men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing as this occurred in your days or even in the days of your fathers? He was saying, has there ever been anything like this? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. And that's why Peter chose it, because he wanted to start the church off with a prophetic word, a warning, and also a great, great outpouring statement that God was going to pour out his spirit. It was going to be called the latter rain. And, and look, saints, you got to read this now. Desolation cry represented the travailing groan, the whole creation to, deliver, to, to be delivered from bondage and from futility. Now, this is what the cry was for this people. I'm going to show it to you this way, and then I'm going to show it to you how it applies to 2016. So study me for a minute. You'll get this. Come with me. And the whole creation now to be delivered from bondage and futility, its cause was in uh, Joel chapter 1, verse 4 and 7. And Joel's day was a plague of locusts aggravated by severe drought and consequent a famine. So rain needed to come. That's why Joel's prophecy said that the former and the latter rain was going to happen. What a marvelous scripture. They were going to get deliverance. How many of you know we need to have deliverance in America? And, and so he has this strong word. Now, this is a picture, all this plague and how it wrapped itself around this, this nation, Jerusalem and uh, Israel and, and, and Judah, is important to understand because this is a picture of the plague of religious tradition that has ravaged the church for 2,000 years. What this is, it's a picture of how 
the, 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 the misconception, misunderstanding of Scripture, not having a divine revelation uh, by traditions. How many of you know traditions in religion have brought to null effect the commandments of God? Matthew tells us that. Jesus told us, he said, you have brought to null effect the commandment of God by your vain traditions. And the church, I don't care if it's charismatic, Pentecostal, Catholic, in between. The church has learned how to do a few things, get a substance of a few blessings, and then build tabernacles around it and redo it over and over and over and over and over again. Until God doesn't even show up anymore because they've got a pre-planned program that they don't even need God in. I'm telling you for me, once the spontaneity of God, the anointing of God is out of the living structure of the church, I have no use for that. Because when I got saved, I got saved in a revival. I got saved in a move of God and thousands of hippies were being swept into the kingdom of God in the 60s and early 70s. And our church that we went to was the fastest growing church in America. We were on the cover of Life magazine. There was a move of God and we got swept in on that. And tradition was flying out the window. You should have seen uh, uh, our first church was... Rows and rows and rows and rows of long-haired, goateed hippies and girls with hairy armpits and hairy legs and, oh, it was gross. And, I mean, all this stuff and, and here we were, just a bunch of crazies and guys were sitting in the church with bib overalls on and hair, you know, chest hanging out and just, I mean, and we were just on the edge. I mean, we were hippies. We had already given up everything for the wrong cause. And for us, to, they told us, you got to give everything up for Jesus. We went, okay, here's $5. That's all I got. I'm ready. But some of us had drug money. I was a drug dealer. So one Sunday, they were asking for a big pledge to build a, a, a wing, a, an addition to the church. And a bunch of us hippies, we didn't even talk to each other. We just, some, my pastor said, I need $1,000. How many of you will give $1,000? And us hippies just got up and said, yeah, no problem. And, and one of the elders said, I rebuke those lying devils. And went to my pastor and said, that's dirty money. Because it was drug money before we got saved. But how many you know when I got saved, my money came with me. My money was dirty, but when I got saved, it got cleaned up too. I mean, I had shoes that I did drugs in. But when I got saved, them shoes came right into the kingdom. Come on, are you listening to me? When I got saved, that which I had became what I am. And because of what I am, I now have more than I had. See, a lot of people got saved and lost their brain. They got saved and somebody told them, no, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do this, and you got to become like this. See, my pastor didn't do that. He just let us come in, and we just, we just came in with all of our broke downness, and, and we didn't know. what We just came to love Jesus. We gave $1,000 and said, that's no big deal. We love Jesus. See, today, people get saved, and then they, get, uh, they go from, you know, getting saved and, and putrefied to dignified to petrified. I'll say it again. They come from putrefied in sin. And then they get dignified. They get all cleaned up and look good. And then the last one, they lose it. Are you listening to me today? Now, watch this. It was so widespread, uh, this plague that it had come over because of the religiousness. Uh, it demolished every area of life throughout Judah and Jerusalem. Man-made ideas and teachings have been a plague and have corrupted and contaminated true biblical Christianity. True biblical Christianity has been polluted by the traditions of men. Early days when we were first starting the church uh, over in the gym over there, and, and, and this young girl came, and she was a, her and her sister, and they were Pentecostal holiness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, they didn't wear makeup, didn't wear earrings. I mean, uh, thank God these girls were uh, fairly attractive because that, that thing just makes you look ugly. And if you're ugly already, that just makes you uglier. 
And one day she came to me and she was all bothered. She said, I'm going to surgery. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm going to have surgery. And I said, oh, you can't do that. And she said, why? And she sat in front of me. She was a very attractive girl. And she just had this pale face, hair pulled back in a little bun, no jewelry. I'm telling you, it was sad. And, and, and I said, no, you can't do this. You can't have this surgery. Well, why? I said, well, because when you have surgery, uh, they, they're going to undress you and you're going to be there with no clothes on. Her eyes got real big. And I said, you know, and in your holiness, you can't go there. <laughs> Next thing you know, she starts looking at me and she said, you're trying to tell me something, aren't you? And I went, yeah, quink, you know, <laughs> yeah. That girl went home. She went, I told her, I said, listen, I'm going to pray for you. When I finished praying, I said, here's some money. You go out and you stop by. I think it was a, oh, I forget the name of the store. It was a little, uh, little drugstore. I said, you go buy some red lipstick. <laughs> she came back to church Sunday, and I mean, she was decked out. She looked so attractive. Her sister was two, and her mother was mad as a hornet. <laughs> she had the surgery. Everything went well. But you know what, saints? That religion can make you ugly. Religion makes people foolish. That's why a lot of people don't want to come to church because they stand back in their cynicism and all their criticalism is because they've been to what's called church and they say, I don't want any more. That's why teenagers don't come back to the house of God many times because they went and got, they got turned off because it was so dried up and so dead. You wait till I finish preaching the book of Joel. You're going to understand everything I'm telling you right now because at the end of this, a generation came alive in God. We need a revival amongst the young people today. But we got to hear this. We got to hear something. We got to get to something before that something can happen. Now, this ain't that, but this is what's coming. Is that? Are you still there? Now, let me ask the question. In all this understanding, what's the answer for this thing? Chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. That's where we were on watch night. Chapter 2, verse 111 provides the answer to the nation-wide uh, uh, dilemma that, that we see in chapter 1 here. God's people must make a corporate consecration of repentance. Listen to me. I'm going to say something. A lot of times the message is for you or about you. But a lot of times, and more times, it's about us. And we need to hear the us message more. Because we've made it too much, I'm coming to church if I get a word. But God wants to give us a word. Because it says when you pray, pray this way, our Father. Not yours. Not mine. Ours. He's our Father. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. But we can make it so that we try to say, you know, God so loved the world that he saved Wayman. And that's a trick. God so loved the world that he saved us. If you don't learn to get in the us, what will happen is Satan will use you in the you. I love the United States because its abbreviation is our initials is us. Come on now. Now, the day of the Lord is at hand. This is what we speak of and spoke of on New Year's Eve now. Uh, the prophet Joel, you put it up there, chapter uh, 2. Yes, that's good. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Two phrases right there. First, blow the trumpet in Zion. Zion is the church. Zion is the church. Old Testament, Zion was the tabernacle. New Testament, now Zion is the church. Blow the trumpet. We need to hear the trumpet of God. And prophetic voices are trumpets. And because we've been so desirous to hear the teacher gift, uh, we've avoided hearing the prophetic gift. 
We want the teacher gift because it tickles our ear and makes us feel good and laugh. But we need to hear the prophet gift uh, so that we can know where we're going and why we need to be there. Five-fold ministry. God built his church on the apostle and the prophet. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. That's the hand ministry. Five-fold ministry is the hand. You got the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher. You got to see that hand ministry. The Bible says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God in due season. He'll exalt you. The apostle is the one that can touch all the others. That little teeny one there is the teacher. Get it in your ear. How many of you know you can't get your thumb in your ear? But that long finger sticking out there, that's the prophet. When you see this finger coming, some of you, I watch you in church, you're ducking like this. Oh, you're going, you're talking to him, you know. There's a laser. Sometimes y'all think this thing's got an extension on it. It just goes all the way back there. The evangelist, that long outreach, pastor on this hand, married to the church. Come on, saints, you hear me today? Now, got to get this. The prophet Joel uses the figure of an army that God was raising up. He used the figure of an army that God was raising up to judge the house of Judah. And this detailed description of Joel's army and points to a corporate overcomer and those men and women uh, app, uh, apprehended for Zion. Now, here's the key. He said this army, blow the trumpet of Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, and let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the judgment of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. Now, we've gone from defining what the problem was. There was a plague, religious spirit. Now, we've come to a new place, and that place is we're defining that there's got to be a new army that rises up in this thing, and it's a circumcised army. It is an army that is of believers, an army of a remnant of God uh, that are radical, that are committed to Christ, uh, that are sold out to the lordship of Jesus, that want Jesus more than any thing else but we're surrounded in the midst of a people today church wide that just want to come and be entertained they just want to come and see who's in church or they just want to come and find a boy or a man, woman or they just want to come and hear their favorite song we better wake up because God's church was never meant to be prostituted that way. Come on, Bishop. And so in Joel there, it's an army that's coming up. They were dangerous. They went in the windows. They went over the walls. They were awesome. It was a mighty army. How many of you know the Bible talks about the army of the Lord? And matter of fact, in Revelation, Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back with that army. You need to understand there is an army that God is raising up. And we're in a time of war. Can you hear me? But there are those that are in the time of peace uh, and they're false prophets uh, and they're telling us that everything's going to be okay. Just sit back and coast along. I'm here to tell you it's a lie from the pit of hell. Come on, Bishop. Now, when God told Noah to build the ark, he built an ark and the unrighteous went down while the righteous went up. God's going to raise us up. But he's not going to raise up you because you sit in church. He's going to raise you up because you're dedicated, sold out, committed to his lordship. You want him more than you want anything else. You want him the first thing in the morning when you get up. You want him. At night you want him. You want to worship. You want to pray. You want to be in God. You don't want to just come along for the ride. Preach that thing, Bishop. It's what we need, Bishop. You see, but churches today want a crowd. I'm looking for an army. I've said about this church since the day we started. This ain't no cruise ship. This is a battleship. If you could see in the spirit, this is a gray building right now. And this thing's got guns on it. And they're aimed from the prayer room to the city. And we launch missiles of glory and prayer and intercession out of this house. Uh, and we're bombarding. You can hear the guns at night. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And they're going off because God's people are coming to the prayer room. Uh, and God's people are seeking God while He may be found. Yes. 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 Y
we all be My God. Some of you, you say, I did not plan all this. I thought I was come to hear a little sermonette for a bunch of missionettes. Now look what it says here. Joel's army, corporate army of overcomers. Verse 4, put it on the screen please. Verse 4, the appearance of them as is the appearance of horses. Now if you uh, compare Zechariah 14, 20, in that day, look saints, there's always a that day. In that day uh, shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. Horses have always been an illustration of divine anointed revelation to show a radical people dedicated to the battle. When you see horses now, you got to see it that way. But look at this, Job 39. Flip over there, folks. Flip over there. In your Bibles, turn to Job 39. Come on with me now. Come on. Come on Bishop. Job 39 and verse 19. Verse 19. Job 39, verse 19. There's a blast of the trumpet. My, my. And it says, have you given the horse his might? Have you clothed his neck with quivering uh, and a shaking mane? Now that, that's a horse. I used to own a horse. That's a horse that's got his head like this, back and forth, his mane going. He wants to run. Uh, he's tapping at the ground. Uh, he's saying, let me go. I want to get in this thing. Yeah. Have you given the horse his might? Have you clothed his neck, quivering with a sh uh, shaking? Come on, turn it over. Shaking mane. Uh, and uh, Verse 20. Was it you, Job, who made him to leap like a locust? Why did Joel use the locust as an example? Because it was an illustration of the horse. The majesty of his snorting nostrils is terrible. His, he paws in the valley and exalts in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons of armed men. He mocks at fear and is not dismayed or terrified. Neither does he turn back in battle from the sword. This is bad dudes here. And the quiver rattles upon him uh, on the side uh, as, he do, uh, as do the uh, glittering spear and the lance uh, of his rider. And it says, it seems, uh, he seems in running to devour the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither can he stand still at the sound of the war trumpet. He's standing there and his feet are stomping on the ground. Uh, clap your hands, uh, all ye people. Shout unto God uh, with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God. Shout unto God uh, with a voice of triumph. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, Ah, and he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains uh, and the shouting. Good Lord. Can you hear that? He says, uh, one translation says, and at the blast of the trumpet, he snorts. He catches the sin of battle from afar. How many of you know people that are dedicated to the Lordship? They don't have to be told. They catch the scent. Uh, they like a hound dog. They hear that God is showing up. They're running to the house of God. You can't keep them out of the prayer room because they smell that God has just showed up. Listen to me. When God showed up in the Old Testament, he carried a smell. When the priest went in the holy place, he carried a smell. Have you know there's a smell of the anointing? There's a smell of death. I can smell death when I see God's people in places doing things they know they shouldn't be. You can smell the death on them. The Bible says we were dead men in trespasses. But it says this horse, he smells the battle. And it's something in him. He, he's, he's from afar. And, and the thunder of the captains uh, shouting. Uh, some of you uh, say, why does the preacher have to shout? Some of you say, thank God there's somebody shouting. You see, because some of you, uh, you shout uh, and you don't know why you shout. Uh, I shout because I got victory. A lion doesn't roar before his prey. He roars after he ate his prey. Come on, preach that thing, 
Because if he roared, he'd, he'd send them all away. Come on now. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. He's heaven's fearless horseman. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, If thou hast run with footmen, and they have wearied thee. You see, come on, saints, we've been in the lower stages of this thing, and we've been panting and complaining because we're running with some footmen. And he says, If they wear thee, how can thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou uh, uh, trustest, they wearied thee, then how will it be, uh, and how will thou do in the swelling of Jordan? The kingdom of God uh, is not for half-hearted people. Joel chapter 2 verse 5. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains shall they leap. Uh, the army comes with the noise. The army comes with a noise. The army comes with a noise. If you read the Bible, you will see when, when, when uh, uh, Gideon went down to the battle with the Midianites. It said they had uh, lanterns and they had uh, 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 a horn and they had lights inside the lantern. And they stood 300 of them on the dark side of a hill while the Midianites were sleeping. And the Bible says that, that they got a word from God. Gideon told him, he said, when you see what I do, when you see what I'm doing, you do what I do. Amen. How do you know in the dark you can't see what somebody's telling you to do? But when you get out of that natural eye, begin to see the spirit eye, you begin to see what God is doing. You begin to be in the right place at the right time because you've been praying and you hear God. You're going to want to be in the right place in this day when there becomes terrorist attacks uh, and there's a third one coming uh, and it's going to be huge over this nation. I prophesied to you the other night and I'm telling you, I've just had it confirmed today by three other prophets. Uh, there's coming a storm uh, on the East Coast that will shake this nation. And I don't mean storm as in uh, rain type. We better hear God today, saints. We better hear God today. Wow. There's noise. Verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before his army. For a host is, is very, his host is very great. They are strong and powerful who execute God's word. Look at Joel. I'm going to let you peek now. Go to Joel 3.16 for a minute. The Lord will thunder and roar from Zion and utter his voice. Listen to me. There is a thundering that happens. There's a thundering going on. When they go to battle, uh, when Gideon and them went to battle, they had those lanterns. They burst them open and light lit up the hillside and they blew those uh, shafar horns. Uh, and when they did, the noise was so deafening and so terrible. The Bible says the Midianites jumped up out of their camp, grabbed their swords and began to kill one another. God will make your enemy kill himself before he gets even a chance to kill you. Some of you that live in fear, you're running all the time. A guilty man runs when nobody's chasing him. Come on, saints. It's time we hear the word of the Lord. It's time we want more than just a good little lullaby message. It's time we want something that kicks us. Where we need to be kicked to move us. Because Satan goes about devouring whom he may. That means he's coming around devouring those that used to be in God, no longer in God. Those that used to come to church, don't come to church. Those that used to be dedicated to serve, don't serve. Why? Because the devourer is going around eating people who took their eyes off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith, who took their eyes off of Jesus, the one that's able to take them through every storm. And they begin to put their eyes on men and the traditions of men and it caused them to fall and lose sight of the victory because they trust trusted man more than they trusted God. I wish I had somebody to preach this to. I'm going to California in a few weeks. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to preach somebody. I'm going to find somewhere I can preach this to. Joel chapter 2 and verse 10. I'm still in Joel now. Chapter 2 verse 10. I'll let you peek over to Joel 3.16. That was just so you could see and be encouraged. 
It says it's lights out for the old order. So the earthquakes before them and the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Can you hear this? That means the old order is about ready to have the lights go out. That means the old order is not going to have a light revelation message. They're going to be standing in pulpits with nothing but darkness. There's an apostolic reformation. There is a move of God that is about to be launched, saints, over the earth. I don't know if it's tomorrow, I don't know if it's the next day, but I'm here to tell you, God is moving by his spirit. And we need to decide, you know what, I'm going to be in this thing. I'm going to be a part of this thing. I'm going to be right in the middle of this thing. Let me land. Micah chapter 3, verse 6. Therefore it shall be night to you so that you shall have no vision. Yes, it shall be dark to you without divination, and the sun shall go down on the false prophets, and the day shall be black over them. Look at that scripture. It says, and the sun shall go down over the false prophets, and the day shall be black over them. Listen to me when they tell you peace, peace, peace. Jeremiah said, be careful. Be careful. He said, be careful. He said, I'm warning you when people say peace, peace, peace. You see, peace, peace, peace is the soulish desire that people would like. But we're going to get peace once we die. But I can tell you, but till we get that peace, we're going to walk with him who is peace. And I've got him in me. So I don't care what goes on out there. i got peace inside of me. And it's peace like a river. It's peace that surpasses my understanding. It's the peace of God. When I accepted Jesus, I accepted peace. When I accepted Jesus, I got truth. Some people want truth, but they want it in a package instead of a person. Some people want peace where they feel all warm and fuzzy. I met him who's peace. So when my boat's in a storm, I got peace. When I find myself and the doctor says, this is the big one, I got peace. When I find my city coming unglued, I just stand and say, I got peace. Yeah. I got peace like a river. Yeah. Sing that thing, I ain't going to sing. Now, hear this. You got to read this. And the sun shall go down over the false prophets. And the day shall be black over them, Micah, Malachi 4.2. But unto you that fear my name shall the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. This is the beginning of a new wine skin, skin reformation. Yea, saith the Lord. This is the beginning of a new wine skin revelation that's coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Both of the church and America. We have heard the alarm and behold his army, the, his first fruits to return to Zion, his church. They will lead the way of the rest of his people. Joel 2, 12 through 17, is possibly the most critical part of this whole prophecy. This is where I'm ending. Look ahead at the prophet, prophecy sequence here. Joel 3, 1, behold, I said it to you in a minute, a minute ago, in these days, at that time, when I shall reverse the captivity and restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Have you say, Lord, thank you. You're going to turn our captivity. Come on, have you know, we've been held in captivity by a Babylonian system of the culture. The culture has held the church in bondage. Our young people want to be like the hip-hops. Our young people can't get out of those video games. And we wonder why they kill each other on the street. We've lost a generation of kids. It's time to get them back. And Joel 3, 1 says we can. If we acknowledge our problem, if we repent of our issues, 
and seek a consecration of God and begin to come before the Lord and say, God, I want to be in the army. Circumcise my heart and equip me for this day so that I can be a part of what you're doing in the earth. That doesn't mean every kid, and that don't mean I'm not putting everybody in a box either. But saying there's a lot of kids we've lost. Go back to Joel chapter 2, 12 through 17. It is Jehoiakim's appeal. It is, Jeho- I'm sorry, Jehovah's appeal through the prophet for the people of Zion to return to his paths. Come on, behold in these days and at that time shall I, when I shall reverse the captivity and restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Like where we stand today in Joel's prophetic day, after showing Jerusalem and Judah the desolation of their entire society, the Lord now strongly urges his people to, re, to rend their hearts and not their garments, to return to him with all their being. This contagious, courageous trumpeter tearfully pleads for a fresh consecration before the Lord. Verse 12 says, this is intense prayer and fasting that he called. Verse 12 in, in, in the book of Joel, chapter 2, he called, Therefore, also now, says the Lord, turn and keep on coming to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, with mourning, until every hindrance is removed and the broken fellowship is restored. Come on. That's the word of the Lord, saints. That's the word of the Lord to God's church. It's time that we repent. Keep on coming. Keep on coming to God. Keep on coming to the altar. Keep on coming after God. Until. Until. Can you hear that? Until. Verse 13, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. He knoweth. If he will turn and repent and leave a blessing behind, even a meat offering and a drink offering of the Lord your God. Look what it says in verse 14. Who knows but he will turn, revoke your sentence of evil and leave a blessing behind him, giving you the means with which to serve him, even a a creel, a meal offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Set a part of fast, a day of restraint and humility. Call a solemn assembly. Stand to your feet, saints. I'm going to announce this to you. Stand up. I need you to hear this with your blood running in the right place. Listen to me. Tuesday, the 11th of January. Tuesday, the 11th of January. Tuesday, Tuesday, I'm sorry, 12th, Tuesday is the 12th, Tuesday the 12th of January, from sunrise to sunset, I call you as a Christian to fast one day for the new year, and I give you time in advance so that you can figure out your schedule and figure out what to do. We'll have a house full of of men and women from all over the country here praying that day. You're more than welcome to come and just be in the sanctuary and be with us. But I, I challenge every one of us right here today to hear the message. You see, Joel prophesied, here's the problem. It's religiousness that's killing us. And he said, it's like plague. And it, and, and it ate up everything. And so now we move from there and we see that there's a sound that has to come out. Yea, saith the Lord, the trumpet sound. And then we see that if we do, God will turn our captivity. Oh, I didn't read it to you in chapter 3. You'll see it. It says, and I'll bring your children back. I'll bring your children back. God is a covenant-keeping God. And if the first church was birthed out of this book, Can we possibly stand in the threshold door and the new day of 2016 and declare that what the prophet Joel said, what Peter said, is true today for the church of Jesus Christ? One day, from sunrise to 
the sun set, we will not eat and we'll seek the face of God. Whether you're at work, whether you're doing whatever you're at, school, don't matter. If you'll do that, I'll tell you prophetically, God will do something supernatural for you. For I did not choose to preach what I'm preaching, but God put this in my heart for this day, the third day. It's a new beginning. It's a new day. This is the day of the Lord, it says. Joel said this is the day of the Lord. How many of you hear me today? How many of you say, Lord, I, I get a witness. I, 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 I catch that. I, I receive that. Let me see. Put your hands up. Stand with me. Stand with me. Now, let's look like a lot of people raising their hand. I pray to God you will be serious. He won't hurt you. You'll even save money. You lose some weight. That's a novel thought. Just think about it. On the 12th. One day, all of you and I are going to be fasting and praying together for God to bring about what he said in his word through the prophet Joel. A great deliverance will come and God will turn our captivity. How do you feel like America's in captivity? How do you feel like the church has been held in captivity? We've become the blunt butt of the joke. And to our own doing. I love it when our young people here in this church, many of them, go away to college and come back. It tells me something so strong and powerful about what they know is the house of God is to be. And I said it the other night, and I'm prophetically saying it again. The Lord Jesus Christ, His church, is getting ready to come up in a new way that it's never been before. It will be the city of refuge. It will be the answer. They will come and seek the counsel of men and women who are godly. They will come and seek the counsel of Almighty God because God is going to sound an alarm in my holy mountain called Zion for this is the day that the Lord hath made. Put your hands up. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for the anointing right now. Join me, will you? Join me in prayer. If you know how to pray in the Spirit, then pray in tongues. Pray out loud. Remember, this army is a noisy army. This army is a noisy army. It's not a quiet army. It's not a quiet army. If noise bothers you, stay tight for a minute. The demon around you will leave. If noise bothers you, you'll never like heaven. Clap your hands, clap your hands. Clap your hands. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God. Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Don't give up, don't give up. Oh! Break that thing. Break that thing off your life. Break that thing. Break that yoke. Break that yoke now. Bondage is go. Loose the people of God. Loose the people of God. Loose them.
under God. Oh, ye people, the trumpet, the trumpet, the trumpet. Father, break yokes. Deliver families. Break those sin issues off their life. A terrible army is coming. A terrible army is coming. We want our city back. We want our nation back. We want our families back. We want our children back. You're watching on the video stream. Clap your hands in your living room. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Father, we want our city back. We want our nation back. We want our children back. We want our finances back. your heads right now, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for the anointing that's in this room, God. I thank you for the sound of shackles falling to the ground. I thank you to the sound of horses ready for the race, ready for the battle, God. Lord, I thank you. This army will make noise and terror will come to your enemy. If one can put a thousand to flight, two shall put ten thousand. Husbands and wives, if one could put a thousand, two could put ten thousand. Claim your marriage. Claim victory in your home. Claim victory in your marriage. Claim that victory for your children. Claim that victory for your children. Tell the enemy to loose them. Tell the enemy to let them go. Tell the enemy to let them go. For it's time for them to come back to the house of God. Loose them. Loose them now. Loose them in Jesus' name. Father, no one looking around, put your hands down, please, for a moment. Be still, I want to pray. If you're here today and you feel the anointing that's in this message and you know that God himself brought you here today because God wanted you to hear this message, this is not a feel-good message, this is a life-changing message. This will change the course of your destiny. This will change your life forever. And the skeptic and the doubter says, oh, how is that? If God could change the course of my life, the day I got up from that altar, the police no longer were after me. The contract on my head to be shot was lifted. And God gave me mercy. And if God can do that for me, He can do that for you. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I've played church long enough. I'm tired of playing church. 
I want to be the church. I've lived in the land of almost long enough. It's time for me to dedicate myself back to God. You might have known the Lord as a child and walked away. I don't care what it is, but today is your day. Heads are bowed, no one looking around if you're here right now. And that's you. You know you need to get this thing right with God right now. You slip your hand up right now, and I'll pray for you. Just slip your hand up say, Pastor, it's me. I need to get it right today. Put your hand up so I'll see it, and I'll pray with you. Hold it up there. Hold it up there, and I'll pray. Father, in Jesus' name, yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes, uh, that's all right. You're responding. Yes, I see that hand. Uh, yes, I see that hand. Somebody else, uh, you're responding because God is moving in this place by His Spirit. If you're here, don't miss what God wants to do in your life. If you got your hand up, here's what I want you to do. Come quickly with me and pray. Come down here right now. Come right now, right now. Get out of your seat. Come right now and get down here. We're going to pray. We're going to pray the best prayer you ever had right here. Darlene, over to the right. There's a couple of guys coming here right here. Anybody else? Quickly now. I don't want to take all day. Yes, she's coming now, this lady. Come on. Anybody else? Quickly, get it right. Get it right today. Get it right today. Come on, come on, right here. Hook up with this lady. There you go. Father, in Jesus' name, would you reach your hands out? Father, in Jesus' name, we pray the prayer of salvation and blessing and healing to these folks. I want you to pray with power today now. Don't you pray any nice little prayers. I want you to pray with authority. I want you to tell the devil to take his hands off their life. I want you to serve notice to the enemy and say, Enough! 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 Father, in the name of Jesus, we break that thing off. We loose them today. We loose them today by the power, by the authority of Jesus. We need to pray like we mean it. We don't need these little weak uh, altar calls. We need people to get delivered. We need people to get saved. We need people to have born again experiences. We need the power of God released. Praying in tongues. Baptized. Fill the Holy Ghost. Look at me. Those of you standing there, reach your hands out to me. I'm going to pray for you. Now, if you came in late, you want to give, you can still give tonight, today. You came in late, you want to give. I know our offering's not where it needs to be. And I know what happened. The spirit of Christmas celebrating Jesus made us rob Jesus. That makes no sense. You need to be generous today. You need to be generous today. If you didn't give, you get a chance in a moment. But I'm going to pray for you. Reach out this way. Father, in Jesus' name, by the reaching of our hands, we make contact. And we declare the kingdom of God is on the rise. For the kingdom of God shall increase. And Lord, your people will no longer be gypsies and vagabonds floating around everywhere, but will get planted and grow in the house of God. Father, we declare that maturity will come, for this is the year for maturity to come. This is the year for great breakthroughs to happen. This is the year for deliverance to come. This is the year for God to have your all. For God to have your all. I declare this first fruits day. This first fruits day is the beginning of your best. This is the beginning of your best day. And you will not give to Sodom. You will not let Sodom tell you he made you rich. But you will give to God first. You will give to God first and you'll change your life forever. Father, I thank you for the anointing today. I loose your people now. Let's pray. Let's celebrate. God bless you. Let's worship the Lord.
want you up on the stage. There's too much stuff up here. These guys are going to hurry up and get them off the stage and put them down. So they'll, they'll load them down here, and you can have them if you want them. You can take them. But I need you to do it with some sensibility, please. And uh, let's worship the Lord and sing. God bless you. God bless you. We have a service on Thursday nights where we teach the Word of God. You're hungry for God? Come and hear the teaching of God. God bless you. Yeah.